and we're delighted to be with you. We are encouraging you to uh, hit the subscribe button, like and share, all that stuff that matters. It actually matters. Um, we're not asking you to send any money. We don't need commercials. Uh, we've never been approached by anybody who said, do you guys want to do a commercial on your show? We've never had an invite like that. We're not asking for money. We don't need it. What we would love for you to have is, or love to get from you is encouragement. And for you to encourage us here um, would be for you to uh, share, to like, to leave us a review. That would be incredible. So listen, here's the deal. There was a question that was asked of me some time back. And um, it is basically this. So I had mentioned uh, about if the Lord came back momentarily in the rapture, and if somebody was like the prodigal son, if somebody was like the, the um, backslidden Christian, um, if somebody was like um, someone who is not paying attention, uh, and even maybe, listen, even backsliding, backsliding and, and living in sin at this moment. And the rapture happens. Imagine the rapture happens in the next five minutes. And I made the comment that that person will go up. If that person's born again, listen carefully, everybody. Number one, if that person is born again, there's no scripture in the Bible that says you can be unborn again. In fact, number two, there's overwhelming amount of scriptures that declare to us that once we are truly, in fact, born again, it means that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. Read the book of Ephesians chapter one and two, among other passages of scripture that uh, co correlate with that. Meaning this, that once the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 takes up residence within the believer, you're sealed, that is, you're marked unto the day of redemption. That is an agreement between Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit regarding your entrance into heaven. So make no, dis make, make, make no uh, what's the word? State, don't be in a state of confusion over this. Are you born again? If you're born again, you have a passion to live for God. And even if you backslide, you're miserable. You can't even sin good anymore. You're in the world. You're sleeping around, shooting it up. I don't know what the thing is, but you're, 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 you're angry at God. He didn't answer your prayer. You didn't win the lotto. So you're taking that on him and you throw down your toys and you walk away like a brat and you're, you're in the world and you know, you shouldn't be there. You're miserable, but you're miserable also with God. And you're really having a battle. You know what's right, but you're not doing it. And you can feel it's the brutal pressure and tension of God, the Holy Spirit and his displeasure grieved from the inside out of you that you're, you shouldn't be in that bar or with that man or with that woman or in that situation. You know, you shouldn't listen, most likely you are a backslidden Christian. It's an actual thing. Paul talked about the Corinthians being backslidden. In fact, first, first Corinthians chapter five, this, this is crazy. First Corinthians chapter five, verses four through six. Te technically just read first Corinthians five, starting in verse one. I'll just paraphrase. There is, Paul says, there is somebody in the church there at Corinth, a young man who is having sexual relationships with his stepmom and you all you guys know about it and you've not judged and cast this guy out excommunicated him you've not thrown him out of the church well i'm telling you something i may not be there but my spirit's present and i'm telling you do this now you take this young man cast him out of the fellowship of the of the church get him out can't come back on the property we're going to get a restraining order on you. You get out because you are like leaven. You're like poison and you know better. Listen, cast them away. And the Bible says right there, put them out. So Satan will kill him, destroy his body so that his soul will be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I, know, I can hear you right now saying, wait a minute, where's that? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to verse 6. That guy was so saved, but he was so backslidden. He was thrown out of church, 
And Paul said that let Satan destroy his body so that the guy can be saved. God in his mercy will actually rescue this guy and people like you, if that's what you're doing, he'll rescue you from your horrible witness by taking you home prematurely. Think of that one. Okay, but here's the deal. Listen to this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now little children, 1 John's written to believers. It's important to know that. Not non-believers. There's no evangelism in 1st, 2nd, or 3rd John. It's all discipleship written to believers. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Do you know what that verse means? That means that we need to be living in such a way that when Jesus Christ appears, notice it's actually not a uh, coming like the first and second coming. This is not the second coming of Christ. It's about the rapture. When he appears, John chapter 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. When he appears, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. Okay, when he appears, you want to be walking with God in obedience and be confident. If you're not, when he appears, you're going to be ashamed. You're going to be embarrassed. What's the word? You're going to have yoke all over your face. You're going to look like a fool. Does it say there that you're going to lose your salvation? Does it say there that you're going to have to, sorry, but now you got to go through the tribulation period to get your salvation back? <laughs> no. No, listen. If you're a believer and you can live in sin, if you think, and there's a lot of people like this, if you think that you are a Christian, but you're living in sin and God forgives you and you have no hatred for your sin, your sin doesn't make you want to vomit. Your sin, you've just, you just gotten used to it. You just kind of nuzzled on into it. And this is the way that it is. I'm a Christian fornicator. And that's, that's just the way it is. Or I'm a Christian adulterer or I'm a Christian bank robber, I'm a Christian car thief, I'm a Christian drug addict, I'm a Christian drunk, uh, and that's just the way it is. Guess what? There's an incredibly high probability that you do not know God at all. Because if you don't hate your sin, because the Holy Spirit hates your sin, if you don't hate your sin, there's good evidence that the Spirit of God doesn't dwell within you. So if you ask the question, do you mean I can be a backslidden Christian and, and just do whatever I want to do and get raptured when, it, when it's over? Then that's just what I'll do. A, a true believer will never think that way. You have to think about that. By the way, to think that way is a term we've used before in some of our broadcasts, and that is antinomianism. It means that I can not only sin... But if I sin, then I give God the opportunity to forgive me, and that makes God look great. So if I sin big, God's grace is big, so everybody wins. You know, Paul the Apostle addresses that attitude in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3. Shall we sin that grace may abound? What does he say? Absolutely not. Because the scripture makes it very clear that you and I are, as children of God, we are haters of sin. And listen, it's one thing to see the sins in other people and be disgusted by them. But when we see those same sins in us, it's actually worse. It's worse for us. And so, listen, it's very important. Will backsliders be raptured? Yes, they will. Will they be ashamed when that happens? Yes, they will. Should a backslider right now repent and make it right with God right now? Absolutely right now. You need to stop what you're doing, repent of it. Repent means repent means get away from it. Repent means turn away from it. It's a physical action. It's not just a confession. Well, I went to confession and I I told my sins to the priest. So whew, now that that's done, I can go rack up some more of the same. You're an antinomianist. You're not a Christian. You're lost. You can't do that. You can't go to confession, get washed, so you think. Book of Hebrews, by the way, tells you you're not washed. Read, read Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9. You're not washed. When you confess to an earthly priest to seek forgiveness, the Bible says you're not forgiven. I can hear the hate mail now. Go ahead. You're going to write and say, 
oh, the holy church, the holy church. What, what holy church are you talking about? Holy church? No. The church is a bunch of sinners saved by the grace of God. There's no holy Roman empire. There's no Pontifus Maximus that can absolve you of your sin. Find that in the Bible. You'll find the exact opposite. There's no earthly priesthood that can have your sins forgiven. Not a one. That goes for my Jewish friends also, which you don't even have a priesthood anymore. You don't have a temple. Listen, this all comes down to relationship. Do you literally absolutely know for sure that God is living inside of your heart and life? You know, it's amazing. He's infinite, right? He's everywhere. There is no place, both physical or spiritual, where God is not. He's God. And yet, how is it that he has chosen to reside within his own children? Is a mystery we cannot explain. If you want religion, do not let Jesus in. If you want religion, do not let the Holy Spirit take up residence in your life. If you want to go play games and sin up a storm and have life your way and satisfy all your earthly pleasures and then slap a slap a cross or a or something on you know on you as being accepted, yeah, it's not gonna happen. No, listen, if you are truly a living new creation in Christ Jesus, you're living for the life of the Spirit and you're, and you're producing the fruit of the Spirit. So you cannot be sleeping with that girl or with that guy or doing those things or stealing from the business and call yourself a Christian. If you backslide, thank God that's for a season, you hate it, it could very well cost you your life or you'll come back like the prodigal son in the gospels. I want to end with this. So in our, our college and career group at Calvary Costa Mesa, back in those days, back in the late seventies and eighties in our college and career group, which was man, a thousand plus people, Lisa and I were the only married couple in the entire group. In fact, when we would go on camps, uh, I would sleep with the guys and she would sleep with the girls, all the guys on one side of the camp and all the girls on one side of the camp and I'd sleep with the guys. And um, all the guys would always ask me, how, how, can you, how can you stand being here with us when knowing that your wife is over there? <laughs> it cracked us up. We'd laugh about that for years. It's so funny. Uh, but we were the only married couple. We got married really young and all these college and career age people around us. And uh, one of our really good friends, I'm not going to say his name. I don't want to shame his family. Uh, it's actually not a shame. It's not, not a shaming, but it's to make the point. Um, I'll just call him, I'll call him Don. So Don loved the Lord. We hung out together with our little posse. We had our guys. It was just, it was Lisa and it was Julie and all the rest of them were about seven guys. We're all friends and we did everything together. We went camping together. We went witnessing together and um, everything together. It's awesome, awesome fellowship. We just lived our lives like that. Every Friday night, every Friday night, it was just written into the code <laughs> every Friday night at seven o'clock automatically. They'd all show up at our apartment and they'd bring chips and dip and food. And we would stay up as late as possible on Friday night, talking about Jesus, playing trivia, Bible trivia games, having a great time going through the Bible. My gosh, those were great days. Uh, they're, they're not as great as the days are today. That's how God works, but they were awesome. But I say that to tell you this. So Don, Don came from a life of alcoholism. Um, his dad was an alcoholic. His mom was an alcoholic. And so Don learned from an early age that when life gets tough, you drink. That's what you do. By the way, that's called learned response behavior. Growing up as a kid, when you see your parents or the authoritative figure in your life, respond to life's challenges, you will do the same. You will do the exact same thing. 
unless something happens, unless Christ intervenes. So what happened with Don is that he was saved out of an alcoholic background and God saved him and Don was awesome. So incredibly funny, great guy. But Don also, because he had a rough upbringing, he was also a little bit, not too much, but a little bit prone that when he got his eyes off of Jesus, like Peter, he would sink into depression. Not catastrophic depression like we know about these days, but he'd get bummed. And then he'd say things like, I don't feel like it. I don't want to. Come on, Don, let's go. We're the Pastor Chuck, there's going to be a great softball game at the church picnic. Let's go. Uh, I don't feel like it. And so Don started drinking again. And we hadn't seen him for like a week. And then Friday night shows up and there's no Don. Has anybody seen Don? No. We called Don back in those days. Got to dial the number. <laughs> no cell phones back in ancient history, ancient times. And we couldn't find him. And it wasn't until Sunday morning I remember when Ralph came into church on Sunday morning and he said, and he's crying. He said, did you, did you what happened to Don? What you, what's the matter with you? Why are you crying? And he said, Don got into a head on collision with a telephone pole on PCH. He was killed instantly. And the police said that he was absolutely intoxicated and the cab was just reeking of alcohol. Every single one of us knew in the moment. Wow. God took him home. God took him home. He didn't lose his salvation. Listen, friend, if you can lose your salvation, you've already lost yours. <laughs> if you can lose it, you've already lost it. The good news is if you got it, you can't lose it. Remember that. It's very important. So what you want to do is you want to be walking with Jesus every day. And so that when he comes back or when it's time for you to drop dead, you won't be ashamed. It's very simple. God does not commit any abortions in his family whatsoever. Hope that makes sense. By the way, I want to do this right now. Father, for anyone who's out there right now that is just struggling with life itself, they may be able to say right now, I do believe, Pastor Jack, that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and he rose again from the dead, but I've been such a terrible witness. I've messed up left and right. I hate myself for it. I know I've offended Jesus. I've sinned against God. And I, I just can't even stand to look at myself in the mirror. Lord, you would say, Lord, depart from me. Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Listen, my friend, there's, there's nobody in this podcast right now um, that would say to you, you know, get out. But for every true Christian, we would say to you right now, we know exactly how you feel. We've all been there. So I want to encourage you to come back home real quick. It takes a, it takes a nanosecond. I know it feels like the enemy is shouting at you. God won't have you. Look at you, you terrible person. God will not accept you back. Satan's a liar. Don't listen to him. Go back to Jesus. Come back to Jesus right now. And get back on the course and keep your eyes set on the cross. And God will restore you. He will restore what the moth and the rust, the alcohol, the money, the girls, the guys, the toys of this world have robbed from you. And he'll restore you. And he, he loves to do that. If, if, you've, if you've prayed that prayer, man, drop, drop us a note. We'd love to hear that from you. So, All right, until next time, God bless you guys. Well, friends, I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles today, and we're going to dive into something amazing. And it's this. It is the fact that the God of the Bible, this God, the, this redemptive God, is a God that restores and he reboots life. Think about it for a moment. It shouldn't surprise us, the Bible. God's will revealed to mankind. What is his will? What does God want for your life? For you to have, and I use the term reboot because we, we live in a computer age. You know what that means. When something's wrong, you can start again. Doesn't that sound good to you? I know, listen, I can tell you right now, I'm almost, I'm getting close to 50 years as being a Christian. He saved my life. He took a uh, piece of work <laughs> in my life and he redeemed me he restored me in a word he rebooted me and made me somebody new but i'm not unique to that that's god's promise for your life and for mine god's word through the book of romans about god restoring 
That pertains to your life and mine. I hope you listen with a keen ear and that you're very blessed by the Word of God. The Holy Spirit guides you and leads you. Now, there are people who claim faith, but have you noticed they're bouncing off the guardrails all the time and always getting themselves in trouble or following the latest, greatest, strangest thing? And you wonder, where's the Holy Spirit in their life? Well, I don't know, but one of the hallmarks of being a true child of God is that your life is led by the Spirit of God. And when God does that, he uses the guidance of the Word of God, the Bible. Sanctification. Quite awesome. Quite exciting. And um, I think about you know, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, where in our lives, um, we put him through a lot. He's with us every day. Remember, Christ said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But technically, Jesus is seated at the right hand of, of the Father right now in heaven. So how is it that Jesus is with us? The Holy Spirit. And uh, what we put him through in just a day, think of the grace that he gives us. But he's there. And then I might add, he puts us through a lot of stuff too. Does he not? Have you ever tried to get away with something as a Christian? Yeah, you're laughing because you can't do it, huh? Because he, he's with you. And he'll, he'll bust you. And he'll tell you, no, you, you can't do that. Listen, this is terrible. I'll confess this in front of you guys, but don't tell anybody. So... <laughs> And if I already told you this, just ignore it. But I was asked to be um, on, a, on a broadcast. And so I went to their studios and it was a Christian uh, organization. And they're doing this, they got the cameras all set up in this stage in this studio and everything. And, and so it's like, okay, let's, you know, here we go. So like three, two, one. And they go like that, you know. And the guy goes, okay, well, here we are. It's nice to have you. Um, before we get started, can we challenge you to a push-up contest? And I thought, this is actually a joke. They, they were joking. The cameras aren't really running. We're not, we're not ready yet. And they must have a problem. And uh, I go, okay, whatever you want. And I, I, didn't think, I didn't think the cameras were on. And so they got this young guy, I'll challenge you to a push-up contest. How old are you? I'm 65 and a half. How, how old are you? I'm like 39 and a half. So all right, I know how this is going to go. But remember, the cameras aren't running. So I thought. So we're, we're doing push-ups. And he starts, I could see him on the side of my eye. He starts weakening. And that's very inspiring. <laughs> and so, so he taps out, I think, at 29. Little did he know, I, I can do 50. I know I can do 50. It's just, I'm not strong. I just can do 50. And so, watch the Holy Spirit. This is real. At my expense, I'm going under the bus right now. Here we go. So what do I say to me? Let's, let's blow these guys out of the water. So I, I say, I'll stop at 50 like nothing happened. So I, 30, 31, and I hear the Holy Spirit say, what are you doing? I'm doing 32, God. <laughs> 33, and the Lord says, you're gloating. Stop. So I get up and I sat down and lo and behold, when they published it, it was on, it was on there. And, um, but it reminds me where I was willing to do what I wanted to do because I had the situation, but the Holy Spirit stepped in unbeknownst to anybody in the universe and taps me on the noodle and says, Jack, you're gloating, stop it. Just beat them enough and then quit. <laughs> and, and so I was humbled. I won the contest, but I was taken to the woodshed by the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Yes. Because that's pride. Yes. 
And uh, the whole time I sat there, I could just hear the Lord saying, don't, don't do that again. And I love you, Jack, but don't do it again. And so we put him through stuff, but he puts us through stuff. But the stuff he puts us through is always for our good. Always for our good. And we're going we're gonna to know a lot about that today, which brings us to the, really the argument of this portion of Romans chapter 8, and that is glorification. Redemption, justification, sanctification, to what end? Glorification. Friends, listen, according to the Bible, God's intent, and he will fulfill it, is to get you, the believer, into heaven, glorified, but the glorification begins before you enter heaven. He's working in your life now. And he's developing us. And he's working in us. So number one, mark it down. The title of the message is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? And the answer is, when time is running out. What are you waiting for? Time is running out. But you might be surprised on how I throw this out to you. As a believer, I know time is running out. That's a great thing for the Christian The world doesn't want to hear this. In fact, in the world right now, they already turned off the message. If if this is airing later on the radio, they'll turn it off. Why? The world doesn't want to hear about time running out. Why? It makes them nervous. They get scared. They don't want to come to an end. They want to keep maybe milking it one more day, you know? For the believer, when time is running out, and it is running out, the glorious thing is this, that for us as Christians, the meaning of it all is, and mark it down, is that we are to be looking now to practice expectation as a Christian every day. Time's running out, so how are we to respond as believers? You do know that we are one day closer to going to heaven. This is very, very important. Mark this down if you would. It's 2 Corinthians, and it's in chapter 6, and the Bible tells us there that, um, beginning in verse 1, we then, as workers together with him... Notice the beauty of this. We then as workers together with him, that's the Lord, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. That simply means that when you hear Bible doctrine, you better reel it into your soul, better bury it in your heart somewhere. Don't let it bounce off into the dirt. It's valuable. It's the most valuable thing. And so Paul is saying to the Corinthians that we are working together to get the word to the world. Watch verse two. For he says, and this is what God says today, in an acceptable time I have heard you. Did you know that God wants to hear from you? For some of you, he's been waiting to hear from you. Like A.W. Tozer says, he's been waiting to hear from you and you have made him wait so, so very long. Don't do that. He's waiting to hear from you. In an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do you sense urgency in that? You should. That verse is extremely urgent. But when I think about the ministry of Jesus in the four gospels, wasn't his ministry urgent? He was always on the go, always on the go. And by the way, even when he took a break, the Bible tells us he went away and he prayed to his father and he prayed about the disciples. He prayed about the coming suffering at the cross and um, he recharged his batteries, communing with his father. But there's an urgency. I've noticed more and more in the Christian life over these last several years, there's a great sense of urgency in the lives of those that are following Christ. What does it take to get urgent about the things of God? It's actually very simple. You pick up the Bible again, start reading, return to your first love that's in the Bible, and find out what Jesus Christ wants for your life. He's thrilled to be your Lord and Savior, and he wants to use you in a powerful way. But know this, for the believer, time is running out, and that's a good thing. We need deadlines. Do you work good on deadlines? I have to have... You know, we're all different, but we're all, in some way, shape, or form, we're all victims of procrastination. Um, I am terrible. I've always been this way. It's not good. I'm not commending this. uh, I'm trying to change it. It just hasn't worked. (laughs) Uh, But 
I'm able to do something well, but I have to do it nonstop. And the only way that I can do it nonstop is if I do it uh, when I only have three hours left. Right? So if, I, if there's a, a, book, a deadline for a book, right? Well, you have to have this, these many words by a certain time. And in my mind, I think, oh, okay, I haven't got three months. And, you know, you think about it, I'll just do a little bit every day. Isn't that always the line? I'll just do a little bit every day. And then two weeks goes by and you haven't started yet. And then two months goes by and you haven't started yet. And then you start to sweat and freak. And that's why God made coffee. <laughs> pots and pots of coffee. But um, time is running out. But for the believer, that's a good thing. Because we've got a date with eternity, guaranteed by Jesus. And it's called glory. And in Romans 8, from this chapter, uh, verse 18 on, it's about the glory that awaits us. And we want to bring as many men and women and boys and girls with us as possible. We want to share the good news. And there's a good life to be lived with Christ. I found out last night that my son-in-law was reading Kirk Cameron's uh, new book, Brave Book Series, up in the Sacramento area uh, at the public library. And all of the woke uh, groomers or whatever, they got all upset. They got all upset because he was reading a book uh, to the kids that came to the library on character, don't tell lies, speak the truth, and be nice to one another. And uh, some of the people made a comment, we can't live like this. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I thought it was great. <laughs> what do you mean we can't live like this? Listen, it's easy to criticize people who don't hold your biblical worldview. But listen, it's, it's another thing to love them enough into the kingdom of God. They're blind. They don't see. They don't know. And so we urge you, so to speak, right, to consider the forgiveness of God and that God's got a glorious plan for you. And you don't have to worry about the coming end. For us as the believers, the coming end is the entrance into the beginning. It's absolutely awesome. It's thrilling. But we practice expectation. Verse 18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time. In this present time, Paul is saying that there are sufferings. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. If you don't, please go about to prove me wrong. I know no other individual in history that has suffered protracted pain over decades like the Apostle Paul. I mean, there may be somebody, I just haven't come across them yet. For decades, because he knew Jesus Christ, he was beaten with the Roman flagellum, which is also known as the cat of nine tails. It's a, it's a wooden uh, handle with a leather ball at the end with nine leather strips of bone, glass, and rock. And Paul was whipped at least three times and each time, each time stands for 39 whippings. He was stoned and left for dead. Shipwrecked numerous times. I mean, over and over it goes. Paul the apostle, all he had to do is denounce the name of Jesus and everything would have gone calm, right? He couldn't do it. Christ had become so big to him and so real that even if he would have denied Christ, he would have had to confess that I'm lying. I mean, think about it. What if somebody stormed into your life today and said, denounce Christ or I'm going to cut your head off? I would first of all say, listen, it's possible you pull my fingernails out. That's going to hurt. It's possible that you're going to pull my teeth out with a pair of pliers. That's not fun. If at any time my emotions cave in and say, I denounce Christ, I must tell you now, I'll be lying. Yeah. Right on. Are you hearing me, people? If you extract that confession from me before you get started on torturing me, I won't mean it. So go at it, <laughs> right? Think about it. They just might save themselves some grief and just cut your head off and be done with it. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have taken away the power of the enemy to bring upon you condemnation. 
or you've taken away the opportunity that you could cave in such a moment and deny Christ. No, you tell him right up front, if I do under duress, it's not going to be me denying Christ. That'd be my weak flesh screaming for mercy, but I won't be, I won't mean it. Expectation, expectation of this sufferings. Who wants to hear this sufferings in this present time? The Bible says there's sufferings. When he says consider, write that word down, would you? It's a mathematical or it's a, um, it's a term of uh, math in the first world. You'll recognize uh, the language even in the Greek. The word means to reckon. Watch this. I reckon. I've done the math. I've looked at the word of God. I've looked at life. I have figured this out from God's word. I have reckoned to count. The, the word would be uh, run the numbers, we would say. Run the numbers, or let's see if it's uh, all worth it. Uh, I have run the numbers, and I found this to be true. What I'm about to tell you, that's, uh, that's what the apostle is saying. He's saying, everybody in Rome, listen up. What I'm about to tell you, I've taken it uh, to the lab, and I've tested it, and it's truth. And here it is, that there's sufferings that you and I go through in this present time. We will suffer, people. Every single one of us will suffer. We need, to, we need to remember this. God doesn't abandon us in the suffering. Now look, if you're not a Christian, you're gonna suffer exactly the same way we suffer. We all suffer. The difference is, for the non-believer, you've got nobody to hold your hand. You've got no promise. You're terrified, and you should be. There's nobody with you. And in that hour of death, when that time comes, you're all alone. And yet, just know this, officially, God didn't want it that way. For the Christian, we suffer, but he holds our hand. I can't explain it, but the more suffering the Christian goes through, the bigger Jesus gets and the closer he gets. And I can't explain it. It is absolutely awesome. More peace comes to you. The bumpier the road, I don't know how he does it, the more he flattens it out. Seems, seemingly makes no sense. And in this world of suffering, I have expectation. I can expect God to be there. And listen, he wants you and I to practice that expectation now. Imagine if you and I take the word of God and apply it to ourselves now, and when the bumps come, when the pain comes, we're able to meet it. Why? Because our suffering has a purpose. See, Jack, I have a hard time with your God because uh, it's, that's really the reason why I don't believe in him is because there is suffering. So can you explain that to me? Yeah, how, how can a loving God allow all this suffering? Uh, well, first of all, we're not big fans of suffering either. But let me, let me ask you something. Uh, what would you do if you were God? See, when we start to approach things theoretically, we have a lot of, uh, we have a wealth of options when it's theory. Look, I'm, if you're going to the right university, the right college, I'd like to know. Please tell me one, but <laughs> I, I can spread the news. But what's really tough is when you talk to somebody that just graduated with their PhD in something. Yeah, how old are you? I'm 24. And you're going to, what? I'm going to tell you how to live your life. Do you have kids? No. Have you ever been married? No. Do you have a dog? <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? You can get anything on paper. God's not interested in that. He's interested in experience. Why? Because when we walk with him through life, something happens called sanctification. And that leads to glorification. That's what God does. Well, here's the good news. God is still in the business of redeeming. What Jesus did at the cross, the power of that and the resurrection from the grave, listen, two beautiful parts that apply to your life and mine. Number one, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That in and of itself would have been amazing, but frankly, it would have been powerless unless he rose again from the grave. Why? Because when Christ rose again from the dead, that is the guarantee of his sanctifying work in our lives. Sin, taken away at the cross. Justification, the resurrected Christ now lives 
by the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer and he wants you to know him personally. Listen, I need you, I pray that you understand this and you agree, to understand that you're a sinner like I'm a sinner. You have done things in your life that's an offense to God and you need to be forgiven, my friend, but you've got to agree with God that you're a sinner and that he's the savior, that you're repenting, you're turning your back on those sins and you're walking to God. And if that's what you're praying, if that's your desiring right now, you would simply say, Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth, I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again from the dead. And I confess that to be true according to the Bible. I receive you today as my Lord and Savior, repenting of my sins. I turn away and I give you full opportunity, God, to restore my life. Friends, if you've prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you by simply contacting us at jackhibbs.com. There's a wonderful team waiting to hear from you, jackhibbs.com, where you can connect with us. There's also much more content there for you to study with us by watching and viewing. And there's many other things there available for you to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My friends, until next time, may God richly bless your life. Thank you.